All right. So, um, what I'd like to do today is mostly to uh, sort of review and summarize a bit where we've come from, and then I think this will be helpful to you uh, for the exam, which we'll pass out at the end of the, the period. Um, the other reason I, I want to use the time for review a bit is that, um, especially the last class, I thought we kind of rushed through some pretty important material, and I couldn't get a good barometer on how much of it was sinking in, and we didn't have a, 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 give you much opportunity to ask questions and, and, and get clarification on some things. Um, the other thing is that we uh, what we've been doing in class mainly is setting the theoretical or conceptual foundation for the study of globalization. Um, and we've touched on a lot of different concepts and ideas. I want to kind of pull them together to show how they relate to one another. Um, and I think this is important. The, you know, some of the readings we, you're, you're doing are focusing on some of the history. So you're getting some of the meaty what happened uh, from the history, and we're not focusing on that, that, that material as much in class. But as time goes on in the course, we are going to move away from kind of these broader conceptual issues and theoretical lenses to look at more focused problems and issues and, and things that have policy relevance. But in order to understand those issues uh, that we'll get into later, you really do, I think, need to understand this, uh, the nature of international political economy and the tensions that arise surrounding globalization. So what I'd like to do is, is, is refocus us on four tensions that we've talked about before, but let's Let's sort of review and give you a chance to ask questions and maybe elaborate a, a bit and talk about how they relate to one another. So the first two tensions I want to, to highlight are both have to do with the international politics of globalization. And all of these tensions really focus on the fact that politics and economics um, often collide in terms of globalization. And that while we start off talking about some basic economic concepts, we're now sort of moving into the question of how the workings of a market economy are complicated by the political framework in which these these markets exist. So, for instance, remember we talked about, we said economics and politics are about different things. Economics is primarily about what? Wealth. It's about wealth. Politics is primarily about what? Power. Power. And wealth is an absolute good in that everybody can have more of it. It's not a zero-sum game. Power is relative in that the more power for one actor necessarily means less power for other actors. Okay. So let's, um, we talked about one implication of this contrast. And that was the notion of asymmetrical interdependence. What is asymmetrical interdependence? Again, we're kind of reviewing. Alex? Is that where you have like two countries, like uh, country A and country B, and country A is, you know, obviously much larger like per capita, so you know, compared to like the US, I think you said Honduras maybe, I think that's the example. So whereas in Honduras is extremely interdependent upon goods traded with uh, the United States, the United States isn't as interdependent with them, so it creates an asymmetry with as far as the relationship. And why is that asymmetry important? 
because if U.S. stopped trading with Honduras, it wouldn't be as a toll to our economy, but, but to Honduras it would be. Okay, so there's a, a political implication of an economic relationship. And you'll recall that we said that from an economic standpoint, purely economic standpoint, the smaller country actually gains more economically from that trade relationship than does the big country in relative terms. Um, because it gains an opportunity to, to achieve economies of scale by selling outside of its home, small home market, and whereas big economies can achieve economies of scale even domestically. So smaller countries actually gain more from economically from interdependence than big countries, but big countries gain more politically because due to asymmetrical interdependence, they, they have leverage over their smaller trading partners, and that gives them the ability to, uh, to, to use that, that power to, to obtain political objectives. Okay, so that's one interesting way in which economics and politics, there's a tension between the benefits from the economic side are with the smaller country, the benefits from the political side are with the larger country. Another one that we didn't talk about very much um, has to do with the, with the goals that, that states prioritize. Do states worry more about pursuing wealth and absolute gains or power and relative gains? And that may depend upon the context and the nature of the relationship between countries. So for instance, let's, let's take a little example here. Let's take two scenarios. Um, they both involve trade relations between the United States and China. So first, first um, scenario is we'll look at growth rates in both countries over the next decade with open trade. So U.S. and China open their markets to one another. They trade over the next decade. And we're going to look and say, hypothetically, how much growth would each economy uh, incur during that period? Well, let's say that with open trade with the U.S., that China's economy grows by 80% over the next decade, and the U.S. economy grows by 20% over the next decade. All right? Now, scenario number two, um, we're going to look at growth over the decade, but now we assume no trade. That, for whatever reason, the U.S. and China have cut trade ties. Okay? Would you expect, uh, if trade between U.S. and China were, were cut, would you expect uh, growth rates in, in the U.S. and China to go up or down? Why? Because now that they've lost access to each other's markets, they don't have room to grow. Yeah, because specialization allows everybody to, to grow. That's the whole point of trade theory, that trade facilitates growth. That's why countries want to trade. So both countries are going to grow more slowly under this scenario. We'll assume that for China, it, it's going to grow at 10% of the next decade, it takes a huge hit in terms of it loses a lot because of the uh, decline in trade with the U.S. And the U.S. will also grow at 10%. So the, the China only grows one-fourth as much as it would with trade. The U.S. only grows half as much as it would with trade. Now, you're a U.S. policymaker. Which scenario would you prefer? Um, 
How many would prefer scenario number one? How many would prefer scenario number two? Okay, give me the argument for scenario number one. Your people are going to be better off, absolutely. They're going to, um, you know, be able to afford, you know, better education, more health care, you know, nicer homes, bigger cars, whatever they want. If there's trade, then if there's no trade. So this helps to maximize wealth, right? What's the argument for the second scenario? Well, Alex spoke today, so who, who else wants to jump in? Yeah. Well, but your gains are the same, so it's more equal playing field. Okay, more more equal. Why would you care about that? Um, because so China can't pressure us into doing something we don't want to do. Okay. Yeah. What else? Yeah, I think um, it would just depend on the relationship with the country because. If you have a good relationship with them, you don't really have to worry about pressure or um, the risks that their growth could present your country with, and it's not really an issue if they have higher growth. But at say in China, every once in a while you do get a little worried about the relationship, or with other countries, we have the same type of like we're not sure. So it's better to have equal growth rates than to have them. So if you're, we're talking about a relationship between two countries that have conflicting interests mm -hmm. on political or security issues and who don't necessarily trust one another, then each side is going to worry about relative power. You're going to feel more secure to the extent that your relative position is better vis-a-vis -vis the other country. What's happening here is that the U.S. and China, uh, at the end of 10 years, their relative power position remains pretty much what it was when they started. There's no real shift in power going on here. In this scenario, however, China's growing much faster than the U.S., and therefore China is going to have more resources relative to the U.S. At, after a decade than it did at the beginning. Now, what could it potentially do with that, those extra resources that the U.S. might worry about? We have bigger military. Yeah, that economic resources may not be consumed in the form of, you know, new air conditioners or whatever. Those re same resources could be used to build tanks, planes, ships, could be put into military. So... You have to worry about um, another country gaining an economic advantage because that economic advantage could be translated into a military advantage, and then you, you have security concerns. So here, the U.S. Uh, would prefer this if it is worried mainly about relative gains. So. Uh, and, and about, you know, power. Now, um, Meg raised an interesting issue. Let's, let's, let's say instead of China, it's the EU. Does that make any difference? Why? Because we have a stronger relationship with them. We don't have to worry about the majority of the states in the EU. Great trouble. 
maybe I'm a big pessimist, which I already know about myself, but if you just told me to turn back 50 years or 70 years, their relationships weren't the same. Mm. So it depends on your, your length of time. On, on, in the short term, we may not have worry much about the EU gaining some ground on us, but you're saying, who knows, 50 years from now. Yeah. So it's not something that would be, it would still be a consideration, but do you think it would be as large a worry as in the case of China? The U.S. actually has an alliance with not all, but many of the EU members via NATO. Um, do you think states actually, so in this case, you might say that the U.S. would care more about absolute gains, that we would actually see, if we consider most EU members allies, if they gained more than us, that actually adds to the total strength of the alliance, right? And therefore, we become stronger uh, as well as they, they, they becoming stronger. Yeah, I just have a question. For a relative standpoint view of a uh, policy maker, what makes a huge, what makes a bigger difference? The wealth or the relative gain? I mean, what would you say? It depends on the relationship of the countries, or is it based on just two factors, wealth or relative gain? Well, uh, what I'm sort of suggesting by comparing EU and China is that it depends upon the degree of trust and the kind of relationship, whether you consider the other country a friend or a foe. Well, you can really trust every country, basically. Like any other country, you can say, oh, that's, we're probably going to be your friends now, but in 10 years, we're probably going to be you know, your foe, your enemy. From a strict realist point of view, basically, they would say, you look only at capabilities, okay. not intentions. In other words, you don't make a, a judgment about whether a country's friendly or not, right? You make a judgment about whether it has the capacity to do harm to you. And in that, if you took a strict realist point of view, the EU gaining greater capacity, greater power relative to the US might be just as problematic as China gaining greater power. And the problem is that policymakers usually don't act that way. They usually do make judgments about whether the degree to which they believe other countries' intentions are hostile. Um, can you think of a case where, in fact, uh, the U.S. put relative gains ahead of absolute gains? In other words, where it was willing to give up opportunities for enhanced wealth through trade uh, in order to try to stymie the growth of a of a, of a hostile power. Yeah. Cold War. Yeah. During the Cold War, uh, the Soviet Union was rich in natural resources. We probably could have profited a great deal from trade with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. We probably would have been wealthier as a result of it. But likely, the Soviet Union would have gained more out of that relationship than we would have. It would have helped them grow more quickly Again, they, they're, they're, if some of those resources were put into their military, especially technologically, right, if we had uh, allowed technology transfer, it would have made the, the, the task of defending against the Soviet Union much more difficult. So we do have examples where states give up absolute gains out of concern for relative power. Um, now, um, so that is a, a, a second way in which power and wealth, I mean, uh, yeah, power and, and wealth create potential tensions or conflicts in the global economy. The first one is this tension between big and small countries over asymmetrical interdependence. The second one is tension among great powers over whether there is sufficient trust to engage in, you know, to prioritize absolute gains in wealth or whether the potential for conflict is considered great enough that relative gains take priority. All right, let me look at uh, 
Let me look at a second issue here. Camera is doing weird things here. Okay, so um, let's go back to a couple of stories that we told in class. I want to do a little check and make sure we're we're understanding, you know, what the the lessons are. So you recall the prisoner's dilemma. What is the lesson that we can draw from the prisoner's dilemma that might help us understand? global economy and some of the, the tensions. Um, so people are rational and they're self-interested, so even though they, and they, but they also want to cooperate like for their mutual good, but since they don't, if they don't feel like they can trust each other, then they're going to, there's not going to be cooperation. Okay. Why does cooperation fail? You know, we, we saw in that case that the two suspects would have been better off cooperating than when they both cheat on each other. They, they, they sort of um, rat on one another. They would have been better off, but that's not what, what usually happens. What, why not? In trying, to get, in trying to achieve the best possible goal and avoid the worst possible results, they end up both taking a course of action that ends up leading them to an overall worse result than it would have if they just cooperated. So if there's a, uh, a, an opportunity for short-term gain at the expense of the other partner, right, which depends on um, where, where a country has a chance to cheat on an international agreement or an international rule, um, and would gain if the other side cooperates but it cheats, that serves as a kind of ongoing temptation that helps to undermine trust and cooperation within the global economy. So that's how prisoner's dilemma is meant to kind of be a parable or an illustration of this underlying problem that makes cooperation difficult. Uh, it also illustrates that we don't live in that world of harmony that I described where interests automatically are perfectly aligned. Instead, there are some overlapping interests, but there's also possibility for conflicting interests. Now, what about the traffic intersection story? What's the principal takeaway there? Oh, um, is that the same one as the lighthouse? Before the lighthouse, we oh. talked about these two cars coming up to the intersection at the same time. Andrew, can you help us? Um, I guess that one is more like someone has to change their, their actions. So like, one of the cars have to slow down or stop or do something, otherwise they're going to collide and both are going to end up because they, they don't want to be. Okay, that's, that's one first lesson. That cooperation requires policy adjustments on both sides. In other words, States, if they're cooperate, when they reach cooperative agreements, it means giving up maybe their first choice, the choice they would have made in the absence of cooperation. Um, but they do so, why? Why would a country agree to adjust a policy that they would otherwise pursue in, with another country? Uh, there are costs involved in any sort of interaction, including cooperation. So if you institutionalize some set of rules, then you can lower the costs that are involved for both parties. Okay, that's uh, actually this, uh, a second point, which you put very well. But before we, we, we come back to that, why would a country adjust its policy uh, to please another country? If there's ongoing like, agreement between the countries, they can just work out a situations where one gains a little more one time and then one may gain more the other time. This is called reciprocity. The reason that you adjust your policies, you change your behavior, even if it's not your first choice, is because 
In return, you expect the other party to change their behavior in ways that benefit you. That's co called compromise. It's also called reciprocity, that, they're, that both sides will undertake changes in behavior that will lead both to be better off. By the way, there can be two kinds of reciprocity, diffuse reciprocity and specific reciprocity. Specific reciprocity is um, is where I, I agree to change my behavior in a way that benefits you in a very particular instance and you agree to change your behavior in that particular instance, but it has no ongoing commitment involved as to our future behavior. It's more like the ad hoc cooperation where the, the drivers are just signaling with one another. They're trying to get through that particular problem, but that doesn't bind them to any rules for the future. Uh, diffuse reciprocity is where you agree to abide by some general rule that you both, you know, find reasonable. And on the expectation that most of the time, abiding by those rules will lead to both sides to be better off. But even in some cases where you might have an advantage by breaking the rule, you agree to forego that opportunity to, to you know, kind of gain an advantage through cheating. On the understanding that over the long term, having the rule is, and, and, and ensuring that others trust you to abide by it is uh, better. So, for instance, you know, uh, I stop at traffic lights even when there's no other traffic, <laughs> right? Uh, it would be in my advantage to just blow right through that red light. And there would be no real risk to me, and nobody else would be put out. But there's a general rule. We all agree that we would be better off if we all followed it all the time, consistently, even if there are times when it would be more convenient or beneficial to break it. OK, now, uh, as Caleb said, the other lesson of the of the traffic example was this idea of institutionalizing cooperation, creating permanent rules of the game that everyone agrees to follow, creating organizations that help to implement those rules. And in that way, it lowers transaction costs. It's much more efficient than ad hoc cooperation. Um, now, then we talked about a problem. The problem is that while institutions, therefore, serve a useful function, they're difficult to create. It's difficult to get a bunch of different countries to agree on what the rules should be. The institutions sometimes require hard resources. If you're going to do UN peacekeeping, somebody has to actually pay for the peacekeeping operations and put up the troops. Um, if you're going to have foreign aid, that requires putting money into, you know, helping developing countries, etc. So, institution building can be costly. And institutions serve as what we, we refer to as collective goods. And again, reviewing collective goods versus private goods, what's the difference? Right. And there's one other element. So they're consumed after being used. Collective goods, they're not used up through consumption. Private goods are used up through consumption and they are excludable. You can decide whether to share with others. I come on. So as a result, there's strong incentives for the production of private goods because the creator can capture the benefits. Public goods, the creator cannot capture the benefits exclusively. Everybody else gets to benefit from them. 
without paying the cost so they don't get creative. So the question then is, how do you create collective goods? One way is government, where government taxes people and spends those tax, that tax money on producing public or collective goods. It's coercion. But at the global level, you don't have a world government, right? So the question is, how do you create voluntary uh, institutions through voluntary means? And here is where the lighthouse example came into play. So what was the lesson of the lighthouse example? Uh, public collective goods are most likely to be produced when one party can take on the cost of actually producing the good and will still benefit. So in like the case of having a hedge bond, if they can still benefit from actually making the good themselves, it's more likely to happen than having everyone in a little bit, because then they're all going to try to, to free ride off the system, and it won't ever happen. That's right. If you have, if you have uh, many different um, actors who would benefit from the collective good, um, then the, and they're all relatively equal in size and power, then the problem is that they each have an incentive to free ride. They would benefit from the good, but if it were produced by somebody else, they would prefer to do that than to contribute. So what you need is uh, uh, one big actor, one, one great power, who will find that the benefits of having the collective good are greater than the private costs for that actor, and therefore will create it even if nobody else contributes. Now how does this, and, and and we refer to, we can refer, one way to refer to this big dog is as a hegemon. So how does this apply to understanding the world economy and how it changes over time? Megan, can you help us? No? I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> Let me ask you, is there, uh, does that idea about why the one boat owner who owns most of the boats would build the lighthouse, but it wouldn't get built if everybody just owned one boat? Does that make sense to you? Or to... Yeah, I understood that. Okay, okay. So it's a translation to the international political economy you're stuck on. I think... Um, if I could be able to translate it, I think you really have the power to control the benefit of you know, what you can produce. It's, I think that is a power to it, but I think that is a control of, of the resources that you, 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 know, you can provide or that you can um, share. Okay, let me ask it, let me put it this way. If in, in which circumstance would, would we expect, and I'm supposed to stand over here, in which, re, in which circumstance would we expect to see more and stronger international institutions? A relatively multipolar world where power is evenly distributed a bunch of, across a bunch of countries, or a hegemonic order where there is one big country, and then a bunch of smaller countries. Hegemonic. Hegemonic. Now, what's interesting about this theory, this is called hegemonic stability theory, right? The hegemons <laughs> create the conditions for international stability and openness. One way we might, one assumption we might make if we were talking about a hegemonic power, a dominant country, is, oh, well, a dominant country will be a predatory power, right? Will be a, a malign power that will use its power to exploit the weak, okay? That might be one way in which we would, and some, some authors, you know, writing about imperialism or things like that, 
might in fact describe a hegemonic order in those terms. This theory kind of says the opposite, right? It says it's in the interest of the hegemon. The hegemon doesn't do it out of a selfless love for humanity, create these, these institutions, right? The hegemon creates these institutions because it will benefit uh, from those institutions. But in doing so, by creating these institutions, others get to benefit as well. So it's a theory of benign power. In this theory, hegemony is a benign force. It's one that where the hegemon helps others gain. And in fact, the hegemon, in a sense, is exploiting itself, right? The hegemon is taking on all the expense of creating the, the, the collective goods and letting others free ride. So they get benefits. They, hegemon gets benefits. Other countries get benefits. But the difference is hegemon pays all the costs and the other countries don't. Yeah? What is the difference between a collective and a collective? Um, I'm using them interchangeably. Okay. Okay. Yeah, That's public really and collective, same, different terms of the same thing. Yeah. But do you want to give an example of the hegemonic theory? Yeah. So um, let's actually go through and talk about there are two major examples cited of where hegemons created the conditions for international openness. Um, do you have a question? Oh, I was just come back. Yeah. Well, let's come back. That, uh, remember that we said that we had a relatively open world economy in the late 19th, early 20th century. <clears throat> we moved toward a more open economy after World War II. <clears throat> in between, um, there, it was a closed economy. So uh, the basic outlines are, well, the British were the hegemon in the late 19th century. The US was a hegemon after World War II. We didn't have a clear hegemon in the interwar period. That's why that period descended into war and protectionism and depression and everything. So um, we really need a hegemon to stabilize and maintain order. But this assumes that hegemons actually create order and openness by building institutions. Um, what did the British do with their power that we could interpret as exercising hegemonic leadership on behalf of an open world economy? They did open their economy. They had the, the, the world's leading economy, and they opened the, their economy to international trade with other countries. The East India Trading Company that they had set up, which traded with China, which traded with India, which traded with them. Trade okay, with now here's a good question. Was the East India Trading Company, was that a collective good or a private good? I mean, that was a, an organization that mainly captured the benefits that it created. You know, it was mo mostly a commercial enterprise. Yeah. I was thinking, like, they going off of that, like, the British Navy. You could do that for, like, the American Navy, too, like, patrolling, like, the waters. And, like, like, pirates were a bigger deal back then, but there's still an issue. And, like, they bear the cost of dealing with that and providing, like, safe passage. Freedom of the seas. That was a collective good. Um, if the, Brit if the British created, you know, stamped out piracy, that helped the British, but it also helped everybody else. That's a clear collective good. Anything else? One other that, that might not be as, as obvious is that the, the gold standard rest, rested upon British financial strength and, and policy. And the gold standard provided 
stability in exchange rates that help to expand trade and openness. So the British did do some things that could be interpreted as providing public goods. Now let's fast forward to the uh, post-World War II period. In what ways did the United States provide hegemonic leadership? Yeah. The Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan. Uh, the U.S. helped to rebuild the war-torn uh, countries of Europe and separately also Japan. That wasn't a foregone conclusion. After World War I, what, how were the defeated countries treated after World War I? They were, their powers were taken away. Yeah, and, and economically what happened to them? Reparations. Yeah, the, the winner said, you have to pay us reparations, you have to compensate us for our losses in the war because you're to blame for it. Um, arguably, that policy helped to set the stage for World War II. And certainly, it inhibited economic recovery. The U.S. did just the opposite. We decided to, to actually invest in reviving the economies of both those who had won and those who had lost in the war. So that's a, a, a global public good. What else? Well, we talked about the whole Bretton Woods. Bretton Woods, so that's the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs. The U.S. actually, uh, in giving Marshall Plan aid, we conditioned it on the Europeans cooperating to develop a collaborative plan for rebuilding Europe which came, became the European coal and steel community, which then became the European community, which then became the EU. So the U.S. actually set the stage for the creation of the European Union and supported it all along. Um, the U.S. in the 50s started giving major amounts of development aid to third world countries. The U.S. provided security to its allies around the world, right? military security. As we said, it kept the, the, the sea lanes open. Um, the, the U.S. allowed the dollar to be used as a key currency. So between the British and the Americans, in which case did we see more robust institution building yes. in the U.S. case. So one of the things to notice is that, in the theory, is that the two cases, while they're compared with one another, are, are not entirely similar in that the collective goods that the hegemon bore were far more extensive in the U.S. case than in the British case. Yeah. But then, is it also fair to argue that in the British case, Britain was not as much of a hegemon as the United States? That's right. That's the other thing, is that the, uh, some even question whether the British was a, a hegemon. They, they certainly were not militarily the strongest power in Europe itself. Um, uh, they... They could not have, you know, defeated Germany in a land war, for instance. Um, but they had, the, the, it largely rests on the British Navy and British finance as a basis. The other thing is that by the decade before World War I, a number of countries, Germany, Russia, the United States, all had bigger economies than the British. So the British were not as dominant as the U.S., um, so that's a, a, a set of question marks about the theory. Another one is the interwar period. That's a very interesting period, right? That is, you sort of need that as the counterexample of what happens when you don't have a hegemon. Right? And one argument is reasonably, you know, it seems reasonable, which is that the British 
who had been major creditors to the world before World War I, went heavily into debt to pay for the war expenditures. And that this forced them to retreat from global leadership in many areas and even to, to, um, to curtail part of, parts of their colonial empire and, and to cut back the, the size of their navy. Um, so the British, it's argued, even if they had the motivation to exercise leadership, they had no longer had the ability to serve as a hegemonic power after World War I. Now, the other part of it is to say that why is that the, this period suffered from a lack of leadership because the U.S. was isolationist. That unlike after World War II, we kind of abdicated responsibility for leadership after World War I. Now, what's interesting about that is that usually the hegemonic stability theory sort of rests upon the idea that the hegemon is just the most powerful actor in the system, the one with the most biggest economy, the biggest military, right? Well, just by that standard, the U.S. should have been a hegemon because the U.S. was more powerful in the 20s and 30s relative to other countries than Britain was in, say, 1900. Um, the U.S. arguably had the, although it wasn't as powerful as it would have been in 1950, arguably, if the U.S. had chosen to use its power to try to organize an open world economy, um, it ought to have been able to do so. So here, the puzzle is, why would a country that has the potential to exercise hegemony and who, according to the theory, would benefit from that, right? Why would it choose not to do so? Why would it allow a vacuum of leadership, especially when the costs of having no leadership turned out to be so huge? That's a puzzle for the theory. Um, the other question mark is, um, you know, the implication is that once the hegemon declines, then the institutions the hegemon created also decline. That these institutions depend upon a hegemon too. That without a hegemon, we go back to the free rider problem. And in a multipolar world, these institutions kind of fall apart. Right? That's one argument. And that's supposedly what happened in, at the end of British hegemony. However, Robert Cohen has made a slightly different argument. He says that institutions are expensive to create, but cheap to maintain. Once you have them up and running, they kind of run without a lot of investment. So investing in pulling, you know, getting agreement on a new institution is hard. But once it's in place and people have, you know, adapted to it, it kind of runs on its own. If that's true, then the institutions, the Bretton Woods institutions that the U.S. created after World War II, they might survive and continue to work even if the U.S. declines, even if we enter a more multipolar world. Okay. Now, let's assume that the U.S. is in a period of decline. Decline vis-a-vis -vis who? Power is relative, right? So who are we declining as compared with? Who's gaining power at our expense? Europe? Japan? Who's gaining power at our expense? Everybody thinks China. More broadly, if, if you want to think about uh, you know, Brazil, India, etc. 
But you know, even the biggest of the non-Chinese BRICs, India, India's economy is only a third the size of China's. So um, it's really China. Uh, that's the biggest one. Now, in order for um, now we would have to think about if if we want to think through hegemonic stability theory. There's several things to think about. Cohen says, even if the hegemon declines, the existing institutions are easy to maintain, so they'll keep working and you can maintain an open economy despite have, you know, having a more multipolar world. Well, if that multipolar world means China being roughly equal to the US or even surpassing the US, does China buy into the existing global order? Does China want the same order to persist? Or if China gains enough power, will it try to transform the rules? That's one question. Um, another question is, you know, the, the, the choice has been posed in the past between either a hegemon and a bunch of smaller powers or a multipolar system with many. But actually what we might be looking at is a bipolar order, right, where China and the U.S. are, the, are roughly equal and way ahead of everybody else. So can they get along? Can they jointly manage the international economy? Or will they fall into rivalry? Um, if China gained enough power to reshape the global economic institutions, would they prefer an open, liberal international economic order? Britain was a liberal power. It was a liberal democracy. The United States is a liberal democracy. China is not a liberal democracy. So would China, a not non-liberal democracy, authoritarian country where the state still has a lot of control over its economy, would China, if it had the ability to set the rules, would it set the kind of open, liberal, free trade rules that we've associated with hegemony in the past? Or would it create something very different? Could you see something similar happening as were the U.S. Um, Britain were in, the, in a war period because I feel like if you look at China's history of, and their government, they really are more, they don't really care. I mean, this is a generalization. They don't really care as much about the rest of the world. They do about themselves. So could you say that they might use more protectionism for themselves and as the U.S. declines and they're not doing anything? Could you also say that then war would be possible in that time? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> There's a lot of debate. There's a fascinating debate, uh, which we could spend all semester on. I have spent all semester, actually. Uh, a realist like John Mearsheimer says, war is inevitable. Uh, John Eikenberry, a, a liberal, says, no, China has benefited more from the existing liberal order than it's ever benefited in its history. And China buys into the existing rules because it's never had it so good. And um, then there's every position in between. So China is a huge question mark. And I don't think the theory of hegemonic stability provides a clear answer of what happens if there's a transition of power from the US to China. Kim? Oh, I was just going to say, you sort of already hit it though, that I think China has largely adopted the at least international system, the international economy, and it definitely benefits more. Like, it knows how to play by those rules, so I don't, I don't think it would be in its benefit to close it. And furthermore, I know that when looking at some of, like, the bilateral trade agreements that China makes with other nations, it tends to follow the same sort of ideas that America follows in the sense that it likes to be able to monopolize their economy by using its larger economy to kind of control things. So I feel like even if China was in the U.S.'s position, it would probably operate much in the same way internationally. Well, think about, though, look at solar and um, wind turbine cells. 
China went from basically having no industries to controlling about 60% of sales in both of those sectors globally within like five to 10 years. Uh, was that just a purely market-driven process? No, the, the, they got subsidized loans, free land, uh, technology transfer. There were all kinds of benefits that allowed Chinese manufacturers of solar photovoltaic cells and wind turbines to drive down costs and underprice their foreign competitors and drive those competitors out of business ultimately. So, uh, Solyndra, what's it called? Uh, Solyndra, the, the controversial company that, that Obama put a half billion dollars subsidy into and then it folded. It had great technology. It had great technology. The problem was that it had not, its business plan had not anticipated that solar cells would drop by 80% in price because of Chinese competition. And so uh, it, it was too expensive. So um, that's not consistent with global trade goals. Um, foreign aid, China's going into Africa. There's developed a set of general norms about what kind of conditions to place on foreign aid to ensure that it's used for its intended purposes and not diverted to corruption, et cetera, et cetera. China generally doesn't follow those norms. It generally gives you know, aid without any strings attached. Um, so China, uh, China's not entirely uh, bought into <laughs> the, the, all the rules of the global economic, existing global economic order. Same with, oh, no. Same with patents. My dad's been in the wind industry for years, and they would hire my dad's company. Well, my dad actually used to work for Enron. They'd hire Enron, Taka, whatever, and to go over there and build the turbines. And then as soon as they would leave, they would assemble them and steal the technology. And right. Their own. There's technology theft. There's intellectual yeah. property right issues. Um, so China is not always an exemplary player within the existing system. With, with the, the hegemonic theory, what would... If China was to try to surpass the U.S., they would have to get rid of the U.S. as the, the dollars, the reserve currency, um, I guess. And then, because I know with the RMB, like, could they ever... I mean, obviously, I don't think the euro probably right now... Is be They've the talked about currency. making the, uh, the UN convertible by 2015. And it is being used more and more in international trade, <clears throat> and even a few countries as a reserve currency. Um, I think it'll take a, at least a decade before they'll be able to do that. And there's, it's, a, it's technical, but there's reasons why it's, it's not going to be easy to replace a dollar like that. But if you look over the long term, decades, yeah, I think decade, you know, two or three decades from now, um, Chinese currency will probably be dominant and the dollar will be significant, but um, not play the role it does now. Um, do, is that depend? Is that dependent on the the supposition that China would stop messing with its monetary policy when it wants to? Then, because otherwise, people wouldn't trust. I talked to a political economist recently, and he said he said something very interesting. He said that everybody's assumption is that the only way that China's currency can become a global reserve currency and widely used in international trade is if China decides to stop interfering in setting the price of its currency, right? That it lets market forces determine the value of its currency <clears throat> and that it uh, remove capital controls so that, you know, currency can move freely across the borders. Um, he said that that what really will determine um, whether China succeeds is whether market players, is the preferences of, of, of market players who trade currencies. And he said, 
he thinks that actually having government control makes the UN a relatively predictable currency and that traders might actually prefer that. And so he's not convinced that the only that that only freely markets determined currencies are will be acceptable to the financial markets. He thinks that that actually China is trying to create an alternative monetary order which is built around um, you know the UN being uh, traded but at the same time controlled. After all, think about the Bretton Woods order. That was a fixed exchange rate system. Governments maintained, guaranteed a fixed value for their currencies. It wasn't a flexible exchange rate system. And that lasted for a quarter century and it was very successful. So um, it's an interesting way of thinking about it. And that's another way in which China might want to fundamentally change the rules. This is just my personal point of view. Do you think that Israel is a bigger power than China is? No. I mean, economy-wise, China is growing you know, tremendously. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. But Israel, I mean, they just gained, they gained their independence in 1948. Yeah, their economy, I mean, their military power, the amount of, I mean, they are like, you know, developing, like, faster than any other country. Would you see Israel in the future becoming a... Israel a has, what, six, seven million people? Um, that's not even a medium-sized city in China. China has 1.3 billion. It's almost unfathomable to, to consider how many people that is. Um, they have four times as many people as the United States, and we're a pretty big country. Um, Israel, Israel's significance and power um, gets magnified in the United States because for domestic political reasons, it eats up media coverage in a way that no other country does. I mean, we I had a foreign policy class, and I asked the students to monitor TV news and to, to check how many minutes were devoted to covering different countries in the world over a period of a week. I think, you know, Israel alone was like 40%. You know, uh, it, it's 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 a very unique situation, and um, but that's a distorts our sense of Israel's you know overall significance in the in the global power structure. I have a question that's not related. Um, so I always knew the Chinese currency is RMB. How come other people call it how you what do you say? You and. Yeah. UN is just like saying, um, you know, a buck, or oh, okay. you know, it's it's was, the it's the unit rather than the, the the currency itself. Okay. Um, okay. Let me go to quickly to two domestic tensions. Um, just to to those are the two international tensions. One as a review. Remember we said that growing interdependence may lead to absolute benefits for each country, but that it also created winners and losers within countries. And that those who control abundant factors of production within a country will win from the growth of interdependence, and those who control scarce factors will lose. And this sets up political conflict within countries where losers will fight either for protection or for compensation. Another way in which you know politics and economics create tensions when they intersect. A fourth is um, this notion um, that laissez-faire or disembedded liberalism allows markets to determine the distribution of resources. And when that, when markets determine resources, it generally means growing inequality. And, um, and that can mean growing class conflict. 
embedded liberalism is an attempt to soften that class conflict and, and, and reduce inequality by redistributing income and creating safety nets for those who normally are hurt by markets. It's also a way of trying to contain capital within the boundaries of the nation, even while opening up the economy to global trade. And this embedded liberalism is associated with this post-World War II period. So it rests upon a kind of social pact among the state, capital, and labor, kind of balance of power among them. But that balance of power is disrupted if capital becomes mo internationally mobile and is able to exit. Capital then gains the ability to pit states and workers from other countries against one another in a bidding war for capital investment. And that initiates then a kind of a shift to neoliberalism. So if we try to put these tensions together, this is kind of an imperfect model, but at least there's some, some makes some sense, I think. We get a There are two major variables we're focusing on. One is the degree of hegemony in the world economy. Is there hegemonic power, yes or no? And the second is, is there a, an embedded liberal social pact domestically? Or, on the other hand, is there a kind of a neoliberal laissez-faire system? So either, yes, there's an uh, embedded liberal order, or there's not. Okay? And what we find is that the post-World War II period, that combined hegemony and embedded liberalism. And it was a qualified open order. I say qualified because capital was less open than trade. And there were some protected sectors like agriculture, services. But it was a, an, a period of growing openness. And then you had, um, on the other end, a period where you had no hegemony and no embedded liberalism. That was the interwar period. And that was a period of closure in the world economy. And then you had a, uh, the combination of hegemony with the absence of embedded liberalism, in other words, neoliberalism. And this was the uh, 18th 70 to 1914, the British era. And then the, 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 the question I would have is where would we put the period since 1980? We've clearly had an erosion of the embedded liberal order. We've also had perhaps an erosion of U.S. hegemony. But at the same time, some of the key, we still have Social Security and Medicare. We still have some of the safety net. It may be weaker, but it's still in place. So there, the, the embedded liberal institutions have not entirely gone away. The US still remains probably the most powerful country. So you know, it might be tempting. We could put this period, uh, the recent period, current period, we might put it here, or we could even put it here. It's a subject that we should come back to and talk about and try to figure out. What we might want to do is not so much be able to say definitively what it is, but to discuss where it's going. What is the general direction? Um, and if the general direction is declining hegemony and eroding embedded liberalism, then we would be going here, wouldn't we? Yeah. 
So um, I think what neoliberals would like is to say, you know, we're here. But anyway, what I want you to think about and appreciate is that the global economy requires setting this intersection between and the tensions among politics and economics at multiple levels, at the global level and at the domestic level. And that when we combine these two sets of variables, the global distribution of power among states and the domestic distribution of power among social groups, then we can start to see some interesting dynamics and, and sort of chart changes in the global economy over time. Now, I know this is all pretty abstract, but I just have a, a, a hope that having this as a conceptual foundation will make the empirical things we talk about later more comprehensible. Do you guys want your exams? Mm -hmm. All right. Any questions? This is the exam. Can you see it?